Hello and welcome to the Today's Homeowner Weekly Podcast. We're here to help you with the challenges we all face as homeowners. I'm Danny Lifford. And I'm Joe Truini. And each week, Danny and I are here on the podcast to answer any and all home improvement questions. And we want to hear from you. Send us your questions or comments at todayshomeowner.com slash podcast. Okay, Danny, let's get started. Today's Homeowner Podcast is brought to you by The Home Depot, How Doers Get More Done. This week, we help a homeowner that's really got an uncomfortable situation. Two-story house, the heaters are not working properly. They're just a little unbalanced. You're hot upstairs, cold downstairs. We have a solution on that. Also, the challenge of matching grout on a brick floor. We have a way to get around that. Also, the problem with some tile on the floor of a shower. It's just not holding like it should. And also, we've got a great tip on the importance of taking care of appliances. Even a stove from 1953 is still working fine. And Joe, what about the simple solution? All right. I have a simple solution. How to convert an old folding table into a really practical workbench. All right. Sounds great. Let's get going here. Let's go to the hotline right now. Tim is on the line from Missouri. Tim, welcome to the show. Hey, how you doing, boys? We're doing good. I, I hear you've got a little, the people upstairs are hot and the people downstairs are cold. Tell us all about it. That would be me at both angles. <laughs> oh, oh. Okay, here's what we got. We got a two-story home, and uh, we have a staircase, a thermostat downstairs and a thermostat upstairs. And I set it at seven degrees downstairs, and without even the furnace turning on upstairs, <laughs> it was getting old. Um, <laughs> It's 85 degrees upstairs because all that heat rises, even though it's set at 70 degrees below, the heat transfers upstairs and it gets to 85. Now, to, to be honest with you, I did call a radio show last week other than yours, mm-hmm. and they, they made a recommendation of just turning that fan on upstairs instead of on automatic, just have it run all the time. Hmm. And I was concerned, uh, yeah, I was concerned about the electric bill. <laughs> Yeah, that doesn't really that doesn't really solve the problem though, Tim. Of no. why, yeah, why the heat's going up there. Yeah. So, in the way the staircase is built, it'd be very expensive to partition it off and put a door. Yeah, yeah, you wouldn't you wouldn't want to do that. But uh, I'll tell no. you what, uh, there are so many inline and in duct controls that are available, different dampers and different sensors that um, guys can use now. And they're not that complicated, uh, you know, as as long as your duct work and your header box that your duct work comes off of is fairly accessible. Um, and they're not that expensive. I mean, there's there's, there's a lot of what I, I really, um, Joe, what do you think? Because uh, I, I would, th- I mean, this, first of all, very common problem. Right. And you know, you, you hate to have to juggle and play with those thermostats so much. Uh, they might even be able to um, to put that all in one thermostat that would be controllable. What do you think? Yeah, I think first we're assuming that these systems aren't out of balance to begin with. So, you know, a technician would have to come in and check and make sure that they're operating properly and one's not for some reason producing way too much heat. Um, but, yeah, the, the dampers Danny's talking about, you put them in the – you cut them into the, the ductwork, and they're temperature sensitive, and they open and close automatically. Once they're set to the thermostat, you don't have to worry about them. Um, now, this is, again, assuming someone can come and check out and make sure all the ducts are properly sealed and insulated and the systems are balanced correctly because um, there's a, several other reasons why it might be pumping out more heat than, than it should be. Um, but, yeah, I mean, you don't want it to be, what did you say, like a 14-degree difference between one floor and the next. That, that's definitely, yeah. yeah, something's out of balance there. Yeah. yeah, and I was co- concerned also. We have two air conditioners, two central air conditioners, and uh, we uh, last year because I, I just bought the house like September, still needed some air conditioning. We had to buy a window unit for upstairs because it was so hot. Oh yeah, yeah. You know now now that that's yeah. where you can really burn up a lot of energy. Window units are not very yeah. efficient from that standpoint. Um, so I, um, I, I I really would uh, recommend getting someone. Make sure that someone that works uh, routinely with residential situations and call a few people around. And uh, you get the right person out there. They will offer you a solution. And you may even want to get a couple opinions on different ways of approaching it. And uh, that way you can balance that air. And, and you you have to look at it both summer and winter, as you've indicated there, Tim, to make sure that it does uh, work out well for you. And I uh, hey, uh, hate that we don't have a, a real easy solution for you, but I think you'll find once you talk to the right guy that they'll be able to offer up that easy solution. 
right now we're going to go to South Carolina, and Dean is on the line. Dean, welcome to the show. Hi, guys. Tell us about this project. you got a little outside project. I'm sure you're not working on it today, but um, <laughs> what's, uh, what, what's happening there with that grout? Uh, well, we, moved, we bought a house a few years ago, and it has a concrete patio with a brick inlay. And over the years, we've had some of the grout, both on the inlay and the brick steps, kind of come out and be damaged. And I've been trying to match the grout color. Uh, at local harvest stores, I haven't been able to match it. So I didn't know if there's an easy way to try to match the color or if I have to repair or replace. Is What's the best way to do that? Okay, so the the grout you're talking about is, is uh, so you have bricks. You have concrete, and then you have the bricks. And where the bricks are and they're all tied together is the grout that's tying all of that part of the patio together. Is that right? Correct, yeah. Okay. The right. area between the brick and the concrete. Okay. Yeah. Well, it, it almost has to be mortar. Right, exactly. You know, yeah. in, instead of grout. And, you know, there's not a lot of different colors in mortar. And uh, the thing is, you really want to clean that really well uh, with a pressure washer and maybe some uh, trisodium phosphate to, you know, to see what the real color is. But the thing about it is you can um, – Make your best guess. I mean, it's, it's it's usually going to be a traditional gray color, or it may be a buff color. So you should be able to tell which is which on that. Then, um, and a matter of fact, we're doing exactly what I'm saying right now. We're doing that next week on uh, for one of the episodes of our television show, and um, you you can. Apply the grout, and I'll tell you, a great little thing to have is a grout bag. And a grout bag's canvas got a little um, nozzle on it, and you it's pour. It's like a pastry bag. Yeah, like a, like yeah. a heavy-duty pastry bag, you know. And um, you, pour that, you pour that mortar in there, and you're able to just feed it right into all of the cracks. Of course, you want to make sure all of the loose mortar is, 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 a weight, you know, is out of there. And then you can just feed that in there. Now, it's not going to match right away. Um, but most likely, what I would do is give it about a month or so and see how well it blends in. And then if you're not satisfied with that, then you really can take that mortar, and uh, the same mortar that you used, and almost paint it over the existing grout just to put a thin, thin layer. It's essentially, as I mentioned, paint over it so that that color is exactly the same on the top. Then as it ages a little bit, you'll see that it matches up very well. Then what I would recommend after you're satisfied with the coloration and so forth, I would come back and put at least two to three coats of clear masonry sealer on it it, it really won't make it shine, but it will lock in the surface so that water does not get down in it and stain it and deteriorate it a little bit more. But sounds like a, a, a very long process, but actually it's not that hard at all. And you can buy the pre-mixed mortar from the home centers very easily and just mix, mix it with the consistency that it'll go through the grout bag pretty easily. Great. Thank you. Time for our Home Depot Best New Product. Now, today there are more DIY flooring options than ever before, but where most homeowners get into a little trouble is with the transitions from one surface to another. So Pergo has introduced their 4-in-1 molding kit. It includes everything you need to complete your laminate flooring installation with a very innovative design that allows assembly of four different moldings from a single product. You can use the T-molding to join laminate flooring with a similar height hard surface floor. If the adjacent floor is a little lower, you use the hard surface reducer to make the transition or transition laminate flooring to a carpeted floor with the carpet transition. Now you can even use it to finish your flooring installation at sliding glass doors, fireplaces, or other fixed edges with the end molding configuration. The moldings are color coordinated to Pergo laminate design, so no painting or staining is necessary, and they can be installed over smooth, flat, dry surfaces like concrete, ceramic tile, vinyl, and wood. So to learn more about this great 4-in-1 molding kit from Pergo, head on over to Home Depot. Dot com. That's a great idea because if you ever installed the floor and you get to the end of the project, it's like, okay, well, now what? I know it. Exactly. What that. do I do it where it's meeting another floor or needing, meeting a doorway or something? Mm -hmm. And if you just go to the store and buy something that you think will fit and you bring it back, it doesn't fit. Now right. what? And you go back, you get another. I so know. this is great. I think that's probably the reason they invented this kit is just to simplify the whole process. You know, sometimes we uh, we have people that are uh, that that will call the the hotline, which we certainly welcome, and and uh, just leave us a little feedback. We have one right now. This is Dorothy.
Kentucky Higby at Canton, Missouri. You were talking about how long appliances last. I wanted to share with you, I have a 1953 Hot Point range. Uh, <laughs> wow. It has one oven, four burners. Um, I've replaced the bottom element in the oven twice, and two burners have been replaced. Other than that, it's working fine, and I... Uh, I'm a farmer, and I've done a lot of cooking with the stove, and I just wanted to share that with people, that things, if they're taken care of, uh, last a long time. Oh, there you go, Dorothy. There How is. about That's that? That's terrific. Man, wow. oh, man. Well, you know, you hear, um, I, you know, I've seen water heaters. I've certainly seen a lot of stoves and ovens, um, right. you know, um, that last a long, long time. I, I, I hate to think that they don't make them as good as they used to, but it kind of seems that way to a degree. Yeah, well, especially with the electronics and computerized. Yeah. You know, they have to, they can't just fix one thing and replace this entire panel. That costs $1,200, but uh-huh. the stove costs $1,500. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but I love the point that she made that, you know, if you take care of things, That's right. they're going to last. And we talk about that all the time, whether it's your draining your water heater, whether it's uh, getting your furnace uh, serviced on a regular basis, caulking cracks that keep water from, I mean, right. all of these kind of things are simple little proactive ways to make all of the systems in your home last a lot longer. And also along the way, they're going to work more efficiently if you do that. I did an interview with a magazine recently talking about some of the things um, around your home that if you do maintain, they right. will last a lot long. And it was, it was it's going to be a great article. It really going to hit home with a lot of people. And it also goes back to that comment that we've had before about filters, right, all yeah. of the filters in your home. Um, as a matter of fact, I've been in my house almost a year now, and um, I found myself all of a sudden, I said, what? We haven't cleaned the um, filters on the the hood over the range. Range hood, yeah. And so I pulled those down, and it was just sticky with grease yeah, and everything. Yeah. Threw them in the dishwasher. They're all fine. But it's uh, that's that's a great article we have on todayshomeowner.com. Uh, you can go there and just put in uh, filters in your home, and you'll, you'll, you'll see how simple it is to uh, clean some of the filters or change some of the filters. And don't forget about that water filter that almost every refrigerator has. You certainly want to make sure that you uh, keep it changed on a regular basis. Yeah, so thank you to Dorothy for, for calling in with that, because that is amazing, because I'm of the belief that if something's not broken, I'm not really going to just replace it. Right. I had, we had our, I, I live in Connecticut, and we have well water, right? So I have a, a deep well, and I have an electric pump that's pumping water, and we had a sediment problem, so I had to call a well guy out. And the, the pump was probably at that point maybe 12 or 13 years old, and he pulled it out to clean it out and all that, and he said, listen, this pump, is a, the builder put it in, it's just a builder-grade pump. It, it usually lasts 8 to 10 years. You're on your 12th year. Since I have it pulled out, let's replace it. And I said, well, how much is it going to cost to replace it? And he told me. And I said, put that back in the hole. It's still pumping water. <laughs> we are in the year 27, and that pump is still pumping wow. water. Wow. And what if I replace it? I may have to replace it again at this point. Exactly, yeah. I mean, if this thing's pumping water, why am I replacing it? No way. I'm not doing it. And, and something like that, you're really not uh, concerned as much about energy usage because, no, you know, the new ones, you know. Now, you know, if you have a 10 or 12 year old water heater and you're having a lot of trouble with it, well, right. probably be good to upgrade that because it's going to save you money and so forth. But otherwise, you know, if you have something like that, I'm with you. Well, yeah. You know, don't. Don't don't um, worry about it until it breaks. Of course, when it breaks, it breaks at the most worst time. Oh, possible, of course. You know? Like when Marla's in the shower, <laughs> and I'm not listening to what she's when she's yelling. We have no water. Let's get right to another one here, another email. We uh, appreciate you sending these emails, and you can send one right now if you'd like. Today's homeowner.com slash ask. Okay, here's one from Marilyn. My elderly mom just moved in with us, and at 95, she still gets around pretty well. Well, good for her. However, she does have a little trouble stepping over the threshold at the front door. The threshold's about two inches higher than the front porch. Now, we bought a thick doormat, but it doesn't seem to make much of a difference. Do you have any suggestions for making this transition a little easier and a little safer? Thank you so much. That's a, that's, you know, it, that, that's the kind of thing when you're when you're looking at a home, whether you're child proofing or right, whether huh? you're making it more accessible for those that might be physically challenged, there's a lot of things you might ever think about that you need to do, and uh, that's one of them. Because you know you're you're walking in and out of that door, and you have just that little bit. Uh, what would you think, Joe? There's a lot of ways that you could 
create a little ramp or a little slope step, there. But right, uh, what yeah. do you think would be the best way for Maryland to tackle that? Yeah, well, the first thing you could do is build a small, like one or one and a half inch high platform. But you'd have to be careful that you don't want to create a tripping hazard on top of a tripping hazard, right? Mm -hmm. If if someone's having difficulty stepping up two, two and a half inches, um, you could build a smaller platform. But I actually saw something, Danny, at Home Depot that I think might, it probably addresses this problem. Maybe that's why someone invented it. It's called the Easy Access Transition Mat. It's basically just a rubber mat, it's about 14 by 40 inches, but it's angled up. So at the front edge, where you first approach the door, it's super thin, like quarter inch or whatever, and it's very slightly angles up it's actually a doormat? It's a doormat. It's a oh, rubber doormat. Isn't yeah. That good? And it angles up to about one and a half inches or so at the back. Huh. So as someone's approaching it, they don't really even have to step up. You know, just you very slowly. It's not a steep ramp. Um, and you just walk up this, and it's rubber, so it's slip-free. It comes in, I think, four different colors. Um, so check that out. Again, I think it's called the Easy Access Transitions Welcome, Matt. That's a great idea. I never even knew that that existed. But yeah. what a, I mean, you think about, you know, when you think about something like that, and, and of course, many of our listeners right now are thinking, man, we could use that here, or we right. could use yeah. that there. It doesn't, and, you don't have to be, you right. know, physically challenged. Right. I mean, yeah. if you're rolling something in and out. Yeah, I was thinking yeah. the same thing. If you're, if you're um, rolling anything in and out of a doorway like that to be able to have that, that's a, that's a great idea right there. So, uh, and again, it's about one and a half inches thick at the back side. Yeah. So. It's pretty cool. Pretty cool. We've got a nice stack of emails here. Let's, right. let's check one out here from Karen Ann. It says, uh, hi, Danny. I heard you on the radio talking about how to remove wallpaper with a homemade wallpaper stripper. I think I copied down the recipe correctly. You mentioned some type of tool that you use to cut the wallpaper before you spray it. Can you please repeat the name of the tool and tell me exactly how to use it? All right, Karen. Well, what you're ta- what talking about there is, uh, I don't know what a generic name for that would be, but everybody always refers to it as the paper Tiger. That's exactly right. Yeah, I think yeah, that's a brand name, Paper Tiger, and I suspect there's probably somebody else making it, but the company is Paper Tiger. And yeah, and it doesn't actually cut the paper. It doesn't help slice the paper up, but it's a little round handheld tool that has three rollers on the bottom, and the rollers have little sharp blades on it. And you basically just roll it around in a circular pattern up and down. You cover the entire wall, and what it's doing, it's punching little perforations in the paper, but it's cutting so shallow that there's no damage to the wall, and that's really important. And so you just roll this around, it perforates the paper, and then when you spray it, and Danny can share that solution with you again, but when you spray it with the wallpaper stripper, the paper, this, it can soak in behind the paper and, and really release that glue. That, that's the key part. Yeah, it certainly works very, very well. And um, and what we did in a, in a project over at um, my daughter Chelsea's house recently is uh, actually after we used the paper tiger, right. after we saturated, and I'm talking about get it wet, as right. wet as you can, uh, spray it, go around again, and, and I'm going to share that formula with you in just a second, but you, you get it just as wet as you can. Then take the lightweight, uh, what we call painter's plastic, it's real thin, and it'll stick right to the wall. No tape or anything, right, because yeah. that moisture is going to hold it there. And then it kind of works o- uh, over time. I, we left it on overnight just because we could. And then the next day, we, we pulled that down, and, I mean, it basically fell off the wall. Yeah. And we're talking about paper that probably been up there for 60 years, right. two layers of paper. Yeah. Um, uh, Grandma sure picked out a pretty p- paper back then. Wow. <laughs> and uh, so we, you know, but so it really works out very well. Now you can go to todayshomeowner.com and in our search engine there, just put in um, wallpaper remover formula. But basically you're using three gallons of hot water, hotter the better. Then you use a wallpaper stripper. Um, let's see, what is that called? Diff. Diff. D-I-F. D-I-F. Yeah, diff. Yeah. You put some of that in there. Quarter cup of fabric softener, one cup of white vinegar, and two tablespoons of baking soda. All of this works together. All of it's in there for a particular reason. Put it in a pump-up garden sprayer, shake it up really well, and saturate it. It'll it'll certainly uh, save you a lot of time because, you know, not only will it save you a lot of time and prevent a lot of frustration when you're doing a project like this, right. it'll also minimize the damage on the wall. Because I've gone in after yeah. homeowners have removed some wallpaper, and it looks a little bit like a battlefield. 
field. Yeah, and now, you know? you, <laughs> and now you have to repair the wall. Right, and yeah. then so now you're putting drywall. And I'll tell you another trick here that um that we found. We were te- we were doing some wallpaper remover, and it was really stuck um, removing some wallpaper. And the actual part of the paper of the drywall right. peeled off. The paper face of the yeah, drywall, paper, yeah. you know, which is not that unusual. Well, I just took some drywall um, compound, joint compound, and skimmed over it and everything, and I was fine. Well, an hour or so later, I'm looking at it, and right. it has all these little holes in it. I go, wait a minute. Did it soak into it or whatever? Right. And so I did a little research on it um, with a friend of mine, and he says, well, did you, did you spray primer? on it first. And I go, well, no, I was, I was going to prime it later. He goes, no, 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 no. Yeah. He says the reaction without that paper on that drywall, right. you just can't get that um, the joint compound to dry properly or to flatten out. Right. And so we always keep a can of spray primer around now. And mm-hmm. even the smallest little um, you know disturbance of paper like that will spray it. And I mean, you know, of course, it dries almost instantly. Right. Yep. And then I never have that problem. Oh, so that's if you, interesting. Yeah, yeah. If you get into that situation where uh, for whatever reason the wallpaper uh, or the drywall paper is disturbed use a little bit of uh, primer and that'll help um, considerably for diy projects you know the home depot is always in your corner now with our mobile app it can also be in the palm of your hand with digital tools like image search snap a picture of something it'll recognize it and serve up product suggestions in seconds and our product locator will check availability and lead you right to it the Home Depot mobile app. Download it today to get started. Only from the Home Depot. How doers get more done. Let's go to Canada right now. Jerry's on the line. Jerry, welcome to the Today's Home on Radio Show. Well, hello. Thank you very much. Uh, hi, Danny and Joe. Appreciate you guys taking my call. Oh, absolutely. We want to solve this problem for you. Tell us what's happening there with this uh, uh, grout, uh, uh, grout problems here. Well, it's the yeah, grout and tile, yeah. So it's a, a walk-in shower. It's a 30 by 60 uh, um, in our basement ensuite. And so it's on a cement floor, and there's a fiberglass base, and then there's the octagon tiles that are in these one-foot by one-foot square sheets. Right. And they've started, so they started flaking the uh, the grouting, and then now yeah, the t- even the tiles are starting to, to uh, come apart. And so I'm trying to figure out how do I... Uh, remove the tiles without damaging the the fiberglass base. Right. And then how do I re-glue this, uh, get it back down so that it doesn't move? Yeah, that's that's a challenge, sounds like, Jerry. You have a lot of different materials moving. First of all, you know, there's a stress of people walking around in it, the water splashing on it and everything else. Um, but you have the concrete, which is probably pretty stable. The fiberglass which might have some give to it. This is a tileable pan, I suspect, is what they installed there. It's a fiberglass one-piece pan that you can tile over. Um, yes, that's and, correct. Right, and pulling up, do you know, um, so this is something you had installed or you installed? Yeah, we had it installed. Uh, we we uh, made a secondary suite in our basement. Okay. Uh, do you remember if they filled the underside, they put down like either joint compound or plaster or mortar, they put down like a thick bed and then set the the fiberglass in that, or do you think they just set it no. right on top? Okay. Um, you they t- just you, set it right on top yeah. of the you, cement. You, you typically need to do that because fiberglass is going to flex a little bit, and that's the reason you do it. You know, so you, in any case, for anyone who's listening, next time you're putting down a any kind of base like that, you want to fill the underside with something that's going to harden. I use joint compound at my house under under a tub, but in any case, you, know, you can use mortar. But you, you set that in there, so you might have a little flex. Now, the challenge of replacing these tiles is these are mosaic tiles that came on glued to a fiberglass netting, right, because they're 12 by yeah. 12. The tiles themselves are small, but they're 12 by 12. So you have to pry it off from the mortar and from the netting, you know, the fiberglass netting on the back. Um, if they're popping loose, I suspect almost whenever a tile pops loose, whether it's on a floor or a shower, it's because there's a little flex underneath it. And mm-hmm. you, know, you can pry them up and glue them back down, but that's not going to solve the problem of the flexing. Right. So and I'm not sure what you can even do at this point. So um, if the question is how to replace the tiles, if they're loose enough, you should be able to pry them up carefully. Um, You're going to have the challenge of that netting that's glued to the back of them. Um, Do you have any extra sheets of these octagonal? You can probably get them, I guess, if you need them. Okay. well, then I would be too. Yeah, no, I've got spares. Yeah, I wouldn't be too concerned, you know, about just pulling them up if they crack. You can replace them. But then, okay, so what do I replace them with? I mean, you could just back butter them with a little mortar and put them down. Um, and then the grout you'll have to replace. But uh, unfortunately, I suspect this is because there's flex underneath that fiberglass, and I'm not really sure 
you know, at this point, mm-hmm. there's not much you could do. You could talk to the tile contractor. Maybe he has some secret, drill a hole through the side somewhere and pump in something. I don't know. It sounds kind of crazy to me, but there might be a solution. Oh, yeah. yeah. So there's no, um, there's no glue or epoxy or compound that I could put under there that's going to really adhere it to the, uh, to the fiberglass. Yeah. Um, that, that's the other thing, of course, is fiberglass. You know, nothing's going to soak into it. I mean, I guess you could try epoxy. That's probably the strongest, right, Danny? And that's probably the strongest mm-hmm. adhesive. Mm-hmm. Um, and maybe that'll hold. And, and what are you going to do, though? Replace every single one that pops loose? I guess you could try epoxy. Just get some, you know, inexpensive epoxy and mix it properly and squeeze it in there and see what happens. Don't get it up on top of the. If it dries outside of that joint, it's going to be you know, it's impossible to remove. So you know, try to keep oh, it. Oh yeah. You know, as long as it's a clean, dry surface, yeah, epoxy actually might be not the cheapest route, but it might be a, a good way to stick those tiles down, not have them pop up again. And I would also, after you um, do that and uh, re-grout it as you need to, then I would go ahead and recommend sealing that grout because you just want to keep any water because it could be that water's penetrated down in there after some of it cracked and cause the glue to release even more. Uh, so, you know, use the, you, you know, go full speed and try to do every single thing you can to make it last. And then um, if it doesn't, then, you, you know, it's uh, you, you've given it your best, but you'll probably be able to get some more years out of it by doing that. Excellent. Well, thank you, guys. I really appreciate uh, the common sense approach you take to solving these oh, problems. Great. Well, thank you, Jerry. I appreciate yep. your call. We sure appreciate it, Jerry. Thanks for being a part of the show. Let us know if we can help you any other way. Thank you very much. Good day. Share with us another simple solution, Joe. All right, Danny. Many families have banquet tables, folding tables that they use when occasionally when like during holidays and having a lot of people over. And over the years, they get pretty beaten up and to where, well, I don't really want to use this when my family comes over when we're having a holiday gathering. So what are you going to do with it? Well, the tables are pretty sturdy. They typically have steel frames. And so what you can do is convert it to a workbench, a folding workbench that you can store away, you know, put it in your garage or basement shop or something like that. Um, but the problem is they're at table height, which is only about 29 inches, 28 to 29 inches tall, which is way too low for a workbench. Workbenches and kitchen countertops are typically around 36 inches, so you don't have to stoop over mm-hmm. when you're working at them. So how do you lengthen the legs of an old banquet table? Here's one way. You get some 4-inch, excuse me, 1-inch diameter, 12-inch long PVC pipe. Mm-hmm. And, and buy a little cap. They think these little caps you, you can put on the ends. You basically just cut the one-inch PVC pipe, 12 inches long. You need four of them. You just slip them over the leg and then get a cap, a plastic cap, and just tap it on. You don't have to glue it on. It holds on. And that's it. And you just flip the table up, and right there, you're about 36 inches. Now, you'll have to measure you know, the legs. The one that I shot a, a video of this, which you can see right now at todayshomeowner.com slash simple solutions, a video showing me doing this. And the legs on the table extended about six inches or so. And so, you know, it went, the pipe went on five inches, five or six inches. And that's how I got to 36 height. So you might have to adjust the length of the pipe, but, but that's the solution. And, and again, the great thing is you can just fold this up and store it away and just pull it out when you need it. Now it's time for our podcast question of the week. And you can send a question or comment directly to us by going to todayshomeowner.com slash podcast. This comes from Brandon in Idaho Falls, Idaho. I've never owned a home with a gas fireplace before, and I know very little about them. I recently noticed my ceramic logs are turning black where the flame touches them. Is this normal? Also, should I have someone come out and do a yearly service on it like I do for my HVAC system? You know, so that's pretty interesting. I don't really, um, I mean, certainly any fireplace, whether it's gas or uh, wood burning, you need to, you know, once a year, no more than twice, uh, once every two years, right. have the ch- certified chimney sweep come out and uh, clean and, and look it over with a gas fireplace, certainly making sure that it's venting properly. But the, the ceramic logs are turning black. That would just be an indication that, um, that the... The, the gas um, is just not burning off entirely, right. and something is just not mixed right on that, that's is exactly what I would right. suspect. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. It's not getting enough air along with the gas. But you, you absolutely, in fact, I would recommend anybody with any kind of gas appliance, you have to have it checked because that could be a dangerous any kind of gas leak, and I don't know if this has a pilot light or not. And um, 
when pilot lights are blown out or when they're turned off or you don't have a pilot light, the residual smell of that gas mm -hmm. attracts spiders for some reason. We're not mm -hmm. really sure why, but it's it's been documented that spiders get in there and they build little nests. And, of course, that can clog up the system, too. So any of that, anything, you have, when if it's creating soot that's creating this black staining, you know, there's some imbalance that needs to be checked out. Plus, they want to. you should have the technician check any other safety um, concerns and make sure everything's hooked up properly and the gas line it meets the, the code, the new up dated code because you know they used to have almost anything running gas in, in you know 20 30 years ago so mm -hmm. yeah i think it's a great idea to have someone check that out and while they're at it go ahead and check any of the gas appliances that you right. have in the house it won't take long to determine if they're uh, being vented properly because gas appliances are very safe but you have to make sure that they are venting properly and nothing is overheating just as a safety thing there so brandon um Make a call or two, and you'll feel a lot better about that. And on those ceramic logs, there's, there's probably an air adjustment on it that will allow you to eliminate any of that black uh, that where the flame is touching them. So and if they're permanently stained, you could probably replace the logs, too. That's right. the other thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's mm -hmm. not going to solve the problem if it's the burner, but mm -hmm. um, you could probably replace the logs if you have to. So, Brandon, we appreciate that um, email uh, question, and you can send us one again at todayshomeowner.com slash podcast. And thanks again for more five-star reviews we're getting on our podcast. That's a very, very nice of you. And if you take, can take a chance to send us a review, we would appreciate that as well. And we're going to keep bringing you all uh, the Today's Homeowner podcast each and every week, and we'll throw a few extra podcasts in there from time to time. I'm Danny Lipford, along with my buddy Joe Truini. Thanks so much for listening to this Today's Homeowner podcast. 